Before I start talking about the series, uh, I'd like to run a short video. Um, would you give a little background on the Institute? 25 years ago, with no money and little more than a big idea, an entrepreneur's dream began in a basement in Northern California. But unlike some others in the area at that time, this entrepreneur's big idea didn't revolve around tiny microchips. It revolved around some of the oldest principles in history. Freedom, individual liberty, and the highest standards of independent academic inquiry. The Institute is an organization that was essentially bootstrapped based on a particular approach we wanted to take. The approach was to do serious work on serious issues, but to step back and get a better handle on what the effects of, of government policies might be and how best to solve these issues. Well, one of the things that uh, David set out to do with the Institute was to keep it outside of Washington, for starters. Uh, so and not to be affected by just ex what's going on every five minutes in Washington. To think about really serious issues, to think about them in a deep way, in a long run way, and to do academic quality work. We call it the first garage think tank because it was literally not in his garage but in his basement and just working 20 hours a day. From the outset, the fledgling Independent Institute faced an obstacle that in retrospect seems quaintly naive. The thought that with the Reagan revolution in full swing and the Soviet empire crumbling, the intellectual battle against socialism, oppression, and ever-expanding government had been won. In hindsight, we now know that that was, a, that was a fallacy. We know that the very cultural roots of the view that government is the solution to every problem were still there. David and the Institute forged ahead confident that despite the Reagan revolution and crumbling of the Soviet empire, the battle for liberty was nowhere close to being over. In 1987, the Institute's future research director, Robert Higgs, wrote what would become a landmark and prescient book, Crisis and Leviathan, which showed how governments use national emergencies, both real and imagined, to expand their own powers and limit individual freedom. Professor Higgs has shown that government grows not in terms of these usual views of social benevolence, but it grows in terms of crises that are announced and claimed. They create enormous fear, they create enormous anxiety, and they create the ability of political powers to assume new powers they didn't have before. By 1989, the Institute was growing, and it moved from San Francisco to a new and larger space in Oakland, with administrative, research, conference, and warehouse facilities. In a 1990 feature article, Success Magazine termed the Independent Institute the Empire of Ideas, acclaiming its uniquely entrepreneurial approach to policy research and education in producing an effective audience of over 70 million, as compared to the 5,000 to 10,000 audience of traditional Washington policy organizations with annual budgets averaging up to $30 million. Throughout the 1990s, the Institute remained at the vanguard of groundbreaking peer-reviewed research. In 1994, the Institute was critically influential in defeating the Clinton Health Plan as a result of its open letter to President Clinton, critiquing his proposed use of health price controls and signed by 565 economists and 76 other scholars. In 1996, the Institute began publishing the Independent Review, a quarterly scholarly journal that has been edited since its inception by Robert Higgs. Even though I'm an economist by training and an economic historian in most of my writing, uh, I, I have uh, interests in, in law and philosophy and, and the other social sciences and, and, and uh, things that, that touch on these areas. So a lot of ground is covered in the Independent Review. A compelling difference in the Independent Institute's program is our awareness that crises are used to grow government. And this awareness led us in the aftermath of 9-11 to warn that the terrorist attacks may well be used to grow government in ways having little or nothing to do with security. In addition, and based on our studies, 
we advise the use of the constitutional provision of letters of mark and reprisal be used to target, apprehend, and bring to justice those individuals responsible for the attacks. Unfortunately, neither message was heeded as a new area of federal spending and power was launched, with spending increasing by 50% until 2008, trillions of dollars of new debt added since, and no end in sight. Our warnings have come true, and most Americans have today come to be receptive to the kind of analysis the Institute is known for in calling for a return to first principles in the ordering of society, just as the founders had intended. This is a theme that I think is particularly important today because uh, there's a, a, a debate uh, going on in many countries about what the best way to uh, encourage uh, entrepreneurship in developing countries is. Um, and there are uh, wide-ranging views about this. Uh, many of them, um, I suggest, uh, are uh, misguided. And I think uh, it was a good time uh, to respond uh, to some of these uh, wrong ideas. Welcome to MyGovCost.org. Every day we hear news about federal spending programs passed in Congress, annual budget deficits, and the ballooning national debt. But few of us can relate to the billion and trillion dollar figures thrown around in Washington. Have you ever wondered how much the war in Iraq, the recent bailouts, or Social Security are costing you personally? Here at MyGovCost.org, we'll show you the price tag of these programs. And more importantly, you can see what the value of those dollars would be worth if you could otherwise invest them in the stock market. Independent has a very specific mission, and the mission is to educate others and in the process boldly advance peaceful, prosperous, and free societies grounded in a commitment to human worth and dignity. But what does this really mean? We're full of masked information, uh, in fact, information overload, not to mention heated and conflicting views. And how do you know who and what kind of information to trust? Where do you go to find information that's reliable and will be trustworthy? Uh, the noise and the data and the images, of course, in the information age are massive. And the question is, how can we better understand our world so that we can be successful in pursuing our own dreams, as you all here are aiming at doing, and the process of lifting the lives of others? Clearly, the caliber of ideas presented and respected in the public squares of society is crucially important. Now, I understand, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that everybody in this room, uh, myself excluded, would qualify as a member of the millennial generation. That's ages 18 to 34. Any exceptions? So we're in good company. Uh, as you may know, millennials, uh, are the largest generation in American history. It's about 80 million Americans. And clearly, as with each successive generation, past and future, you will soon be the leaders of this country and perhaps around the world. Uh, at Independent, as I mentioned, next year is our 30th anniversary. 
And in our work, we've always sought to make information that sound and then per essentially pursue it to make it critically influential. Now, over a year ago, we decided to pursue a new project that would specifically seek to target millennials, uh, this huge group of individuals, and to do so based on what you and others in your generation care most about. The first question then is, what is that? So are millennials really different in their habits and their views? Clearly we all have the great desire to be loved and to love. We're relational beings. We want to make a difference in the, in the world. Um, but to pursue exactly how people put priorities in their generation, we first had to begin an analysis of what we could basically determine was most concerning to you and others. So it turns out that by May 2013, 68% of news sources for millennials had become social media, and 66% of millennials did not, tr did not trust traditional news sources at all. Indeed, word of mouth was viewed as more reliable than TV, radio, and newspapers. 72% would prefer a friend as a source of information, and 67% would prefer not knowing things in a timely manner at all for fear that it might be less accurate. Ignorance is bliss, was the view. More recently, we know that millennials spend more than five hours a day interacting with peer postings on social media, five hours a day. They find user-generated content 50% more trustworthy than other media sources like TV or newspapers. Smartphone users, which is 86% of millennials, average 30 hours per month on 28 different mobile apps. Even more remarkable is the share of millennials that are mobile us only users, an extraordinary 18% as of January 2014. That's nearly one in five millennials that do all of their internet browsing, emailing, Google searching, social networking, and online news reading on a smartphone or tablet. And a large portion of this communication was not standard news, but a mix of entertainment and entertainment that actually mocks the pretensions of the standard view and conventional views more broadly. Hence, we decided to undertake a new approach to education, not one that was exceptional as far as our previous approaches, but would simply use new technologies and adapt to what the market was looking for, and one that was essentially attuned to millennial habits, concerns, and aspirations. So, from surveys by Pew Research and the Harvard Institute of Politics and elsewhere, we decided to focus on the five core questions but by far the biggest ones, not the only ones. And they are, why is my student loan debt so high and how can I ever repay it? Why can't I get a good job? Why can't I find health care that I can afford? Why can't I find a place to live I can afford? And why is the government spying on me? We then sought to craft a video series that was funny, compelling, and thought-provoking on these issues. We invited numerous video producers to submit proposals for such a series that needed to be part of a multi-platform campaign that would connect to the app we already had for a website that was mentioned in the video called MyGovCost, the government cost calculator. And here's the bottom line. For the video series to reach millennials, we needed to create compelling, mobile-friendly content. In other words, the series had to be friendly and mobile, and also would direct people through an app to further information. But we also needed to package the content effectively so it would be easy to find, to watch, and to share. Theme-wise, we needed to focus on the five, five key millennial concerns. Now, as citizens, most people, it turns out, want to trust the government, even love the government. But it seems like politicians and bureaucrats are mainly interested, or perhaps too often interested, in taking advantage of that trust. Crises, as the video 
discussed briefly, are a way to get trust. You turn to the government because you're afraid. It could be a real fear, a real danger. It could be exaggerated, or it could be fake. Today, the government tells us where to live. It tells us what to buy. It reads our emails. When you think about it, you might say that our relationship with government is sort of like a toxic love affair. As a result, with the LoveGov series, we created what we believe is a funny, thought-provoking series that personifies this toxic relationship between young adults and the government. As you may recall from viewing it, the video series focuses on two characters. Does anybody remember their names? Gov and Alexis. Gov and who? Alexis. And Alexis, that's right. Alexis Smith and Scott Gov Gavinsky, there are other characters too, as you mentioned. The main characters are two 20-ish millennials who meet and fall in love. It's a classic boy meets girl love story, but with a disturbing twist. Our heroine, Alexis, is a free-spirited young woman in college trying to make sense of and her, her way in adult life. Her new boyfriend, Gov, is, well, the government. Gov, Gov personifies government's worth tendencies. He is, of course, appealing to Alexis because he's handsome, he's clever, he's conscientious, he seems to care. But he also personifies government's worth tendencies. Having started an online business that is increasingly successful, Alexis wants to quit college and grow her business with her friend Libby, who you mentioned. As Alexis cannot afford the student loans and is increasingly leery of college delivering on his promises, however, Gov manages to step in and snickers her into staying in college with student loan mounting, giving up her business, and essentially causing her all manner of problems. Gov makes life more complicated, more expensive, more absurd, and far more difficult. He even stalks and spies on her and listens to her cell phone. But every time Alexis tries to break it off, Gov somehow finds a very easy way to weasel back in and create even more problems. Love Gov follows their relationship from the first blush of romance straight through to the bitter end. And each episode on one core question is also sprinkled with other issues that you may have noticed, and we can discuss that. On July 6th, we launched the series on YouTube. As I mentioned, this series personifies the folly, the cost, the intrusiveness, and outright absurdities of government policies and promotes the government calculator mobile app. It was, it was redesigned, by the way, I should mention, to fit with the series, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Our initial goal was to reach one million combined views within a six-week marketing campaign. The campaign included two components. The first one was a rather standard publicity campaign of op-eds, interviews, emailings, social media postings, and networking with hundreds of other organizations and in individuals who might recommend it in social media, blogs, websites, and so forth. For example, um, Tim Draper very kindly tweeted it to his followers and got quite a big response. The second part of the campaign was a series of ads targeted at millennials on YouTube. But to pursue the campaign, does anybody know how many videos are on YouTube, by the way? Uh, I, I'm just does anybody know how many are added per day? 1.1 million. It's something like about a, about a million per day, and it's over a billion. Yeah, that's right. But to pursue, the camp, pursue this campaign, where do we go? What do we target to reach millennials? And what do we use to target them that would make them responsive to want to view a series they've never even heard of, from a group they've never even heard of? So we had to undertake A-B testing of many different millennial, many different YouTube pages where we believe millennials would go. And we targeted that with different ads. And we boiled it down from hundreds of possible pages to about 20 to 30. And I can tell you, quite frankly, I would never have thought that these particular pages, by and large, would be the ones that would be the most responsive. So from the marketing campaign, within four weeks, we had already reached our one million goal. 
And the campaign, as I mentioned, was aiming to go as far as six weeks. So by six weeks, we'd reach over 1.5 million. In the process, we also doubled the number of subscribers on our YouTube channel, as well as the number of app downloads. The app originally was put up about two years earlier, and so we redesigned re it using the Gov character as the foil. So if you go to the app and you click on different things, up pops Gov's face, and it has some snarky comment. So it's funny, it's engaging, and yet there actually is information that you can really drill down to um, on any of these f uh, five issues about the uh, this series focus. We also produced over 100 media articles, postings of, of the video, and so forth as a result of the publicity campaign. On the back side of the sheet that you have there on LoveGov, you'll see uh, some of the quotes. Uh, we have hundreds and hundreds of quotes from all different kinds of prominent people and media and so forth. On September 25th, John Stossel devoted his entire program on Fox to the series, which was then aired six times that week. And we're currently working to organize a second marketing campaign to push the viewership far higher. We also intend to edit the five episodes into one half hour program. You may remember that each episode is only about five minutes. So the plan is to edit into one half hour program uh, to make that available not just on YouTube, but on Netflix, other YouTube channels, Hulu, iTunes, Amazon Prime, Google Play Store, uh, the prospective Apple TV if it ever uh, develops, and other outlets. We also want to use it in conjunction with educators, business and civic leaders, and others. So in effect, LoveGov is, in, is intended and is already proven to help everyone, especially millennials, understand in a storybook way the effects of government in an allegorical way, too. As you may recall, it's a lighthearted approach to re reach audiences on a personal level and to inspire them to learn more and take action through the app and so forth. The series is produced by Independent in association with a firm called Emergent Order in Austin, Texas. We select an emergent order as a result of an RFP that we sent out to different film producers, as I mentioned, and they won. And so we worked with them to develop the script, to do the filming, to do the editing, the casting, and all the rest. Now, each of the LoveGov Series 5 episodes, as you may recall, follows Alexa's relationship with Gov as its intrusions wreck comic havoc on her life, professionally, personally, and socially. Gov creates excessive student loan debt, expensive housing, unemployment, business failure, inadequate exp and expensive health care, and commits personal privacy invasions. Libby, that you mentioned before, is her loyal friend. So essentially, Alexis has two friends. She has, she has Libby and she has Gov. Does anybody remember what Libby is doing when we first meet her in episode one? She was planning to go to college. Well, well, that's Alexis, but what was Libby doing? Uh, she was supporting her. What was she doing when, when we first see her? Do you remember? Was she supporting her? She was reading a book. Democracy yeah. in America. Yeah. Democracy in America. Well, that was under the tree. But... That's right. Now, who wrote Democracy in America? Yeah. There's a man by the name of Alexis de Tocqueville. It was written in the early part of the 19th century. Tocqueville is an interesting man. He's from France. He and a colleague came over to the United States at the time they were going to study the American prison system. So they're traveling around the country, going to prisons, going from town to town. And one of the things that they discovered was that in all these towns, when something happened that was harmful, a barn burned down, someone lost their spouse, someone was injured, a child got harmed, or whatever it might be, a crop failed, the people in the town would pull together and create organizations to help each other. These are called mutual aid societies. And they found it com consistently throughout American society. And they were just blown away from this because they knew in France this did not happen. Does anybody know why it did not happen in France, but it happened in the United States? Hmm? Decentralization of power. That's right. The reason was because in France, every organization had to be approved by the crown. In the United States, you just started it on your own with your neighbors. 
You start your own business. You start your own community aid organization. You pull people together to rebuild someone's barn, as I mentioned. And so he decided to write this book, not about prisons, but about democracy. Democracy meaning self-government and liberty. And it's considered to be one of the greatest books ever written on the ideas of liberty, and certainly on that period of American history. So each episode in LoveGov is about five minutes long. The, uh, uh, the characters, as you may recall, again, are Alexis, Gov, and Libby are the main characters. There's also the drone. There's about 10 other characters who show up at different points. Alexis is named after Alexis de Tocqueville and Adam Smith, hence Alexis Smith. Gov, of course, is Gov. Libby is, is the idea of liberty. And throughout the series, if you watch it carefully, you'll find all sorts of little things dropped in. For example, in the first episode, it's not just about student loans. Gov is trying to convince Alexis to take out more student loans to do what? Do you remember? They want, she, he's trying to convince her to go to Florence during the summer, which costs about twice the normal student loan rate. She's reluctant. Libby's trying to tell her not to do it. So Libby is the one who knows what's going on. And so she's trying to advise Alexis not to fall for Gov's promises. So when Gov is making the case, he says, I know people in every country, but don't believe what they say about me. Now remember, this is the government saying it. So the U.S. government is in almost every country. And many of these, many of these countries, the people don't like what the U.S. government is doing. There's also, there's other many different kinds of things throughout the series. There's a uh, mention of Bitcoin. There is a, a, a um, mention about wetlands regulation by the EPA. There's all sorts of little things. At the very end of the first episode, when Gov is talking about how you have, you have a lifetime to pay off your student loan debt, right? Is that what you want? You want to spend the rest of your life paying off your student loan debt? He says, this is, I'm in favor of this. And so he makes then a positive endorsement about corn farmers. Do you know why? About corn, corn farmers. The subsidies. Because they get ethanol subsidies. Okay. So he is, he's making all these little remarks. And if he's not saying things, what you want to do is look at his facial expressions and his hand movements, because they will also give away what he's trying to get at. So anyway, these are the, these are the, these three of the main characters in Drone, of course. These are the five episodes. Episode one, as you may recall, as you can see, is education in debt. The description that we use on the landing page says, college sure is expensive, and Alexis is getting really worried about her mounting college debt. In her meeting Gov, he says, that's what loans are for. In episode two, called Protection from Jobs, the landing page describes it as, Alexis has started a business and hired her friend Libby. For Gov, that sounds really dangerous. So he comes to rescue Libby out of a job. Episode three is on health care, a remedy for health choices. Alexis needs a health care plan, but the options are so confusing. Gov's got Alexis covered, however, to protect her from her own choices, but can she afford it? In episode four called House Poor, Alexis wants to buy a home. Is Gov going to help? Housing is expensive, but for Gov, not expensive enough. And in the final episode, titled Keeping a Close Eye on Privacy, Alexis thinks she's being spied on, but Gov believes if she has done nothing wrong, she must have nothing to hide. But how far will Gov go? Now in the five episodes, do you remember, you know, a story, a good story has to have a good villain in most cases. So as I mentioned earlier, Gov is the villain but he has positive traits. He has positive traits, as I said. He's handsome, he's clever, he's conscientious, he seems to care. And so the Gov character is sort of the, the foil for the series. But there's a point in the story, as with all good stories, in which there's a climax to the story. Does anybody know when that was? Do you remember? Now remember, the story is Alexis learning about what Gov is doing and what's going on. The, uh, the denials of the, when they're in the bank. Right. When they're in the bank, she realizes, to her surprise, that Gov not only has put her in, has destroyed her business and all the rest of it, but he's actually bankrupted her 
by using the money not just for things he's advocating, but he was living off her money. He has no income, all right? So he's, a, he's essentially a predator. He's a parasite on her, not to help people, just to help himself. And he has this whole rationale that it's helping people in the process. So he probably really believes it, but that's the reality of it. So the climax is at the end of the fourth episode, and the fifth episode, what happens? Right? But she goes to the office of Gov, and she's not very happy, right? The beginning of the fourth episode, by the, uh, the beginning of the episode, is that she's talking about she can't get rid of him, right? And look out the window, there's the drone spying on me, right? So then she goes to his office, and she's confronting him, and finds out that indeed, not only does that she have the suspicion that he's spying on her, but indeed, here's the evidence. He has her, her email records, he has her phone records, and he gives this line about, he's just looking at metadata, and he gives this whole spiel, and then he, she asks him, why are you doing this? And what was his answer, do you remember? Protecting, Protecting you from terrorists. And she realizes this guy is insane in a euphemistic way. So she then essentially throws up her hands and leaves, we're finished, nothing, no. Don't even try to think about us, et cetera, et cetera. She walks out the door, and of course he then, as he walks out, asks her to make sure that she pays off her student loan debts because he had to, had to uh, essentially be the person to co-sign it. And so the question is, can she actually get rid of Gov? That's not settled, right? So one of the ideas of creating the story was to create the Gov character and we're with Alexis as she is going through this 10-year period to discover what Gov is about. But at the end of the time, she wants to get rid of him. The question is, can she? As far as she's concerned, she has. But we could then take the Gov character and drop him into other people's lives for future episodes, future series. And one of the interesting things that happened in the series almost from day one when it was released is people were emailing us and posting on the YouTube comments section and so forth, when is the next season starting? So the original idea of the series was to, again, connect with millennials and to essentially, essentially give them a way to see information that perhaps they wouldn't normally have access to or have confidence in. But it actually has turned out that we may actually have a property, so to speak, that could develop into a large-scale popular culture phenomenon where it could actually be a series on television or whatever you could have conceivably and of course this is just speculation you might have graphic novels you could have all sorts of things using the gov character to look at different problems in society and there's really no limit to what you might look at and different groups of people are more concerned about different issues so you could tailor it to that but again making it funny and compelling and lighthearted is we think very important this is the app. When you go to the app, you'll find on the left-hand side, that's what the app looks like. You notice that it relates to Gov. And uh, what you do is you put in your, your income, your age, and your education level, and you click at the bottom. It calculates, and it pops up with the screen on the right what you would own in federal tax liability or government spending. And there's Gov's face, and he says, Shh, I spent that in the time it took you to read this. If you then scroll to the right, it will then translate that into how many Lamborghinis you can own with that much money, how many Girl Scout cookies you would own, how many mansions, and many other ways to sort of have equivalents in what that would buy you. Then you can drill down into all the different areas, all the five questions that we have college student loan, unemployment, health care, and so forth. So you can, you can see the video, you can then scroll down and find further information. It then tabulates it, and at, at each step, Gov's face will pop up, and it'll have some snarky comment. And you can get further information as far as graphs and articles and videos and all sorts of other stuff. So the last one is on privacy. So there's the episode. So Gov says, I'm a bit suspicious of how you're so suspicious of the fact that I'm suspicious of you. So just being doubting of government power is enough to make them want to monitor your life. 
So does anybody have the app up on their, their phone by chance? Okay, so why don't you put in your age, income, and education level, or just pick anything and, and tell me what you get. So I don't really earn any money now, but I'm just gonna put it into the Right. I put a million. So, $1.7 million is what Right, and what did you get? Yeah. Uh, million dollars and twenty one, and you said I would owe like seventeen million. So you're are you asking a question? Uh, no. Okay. So uh, I you asked, yeah. Uh, so the idea is that you're putting your current income. If it's fifty thousand, say. Yeah. Right. The point is that there is the MyGov cost site has algorithms in it based on the current uh, economy and government spending and so forth and projections of what you would own, what you would, uh, your income would be year by year for the rest of your life based on your education level and conservative estimates. So what would be the total income you would receive in the course of your working life and what percentage of that would go to the government? Okay, so the point is that you're on the hook for this, right? Now, what's, does anybody know what the total federal debt is um, gonna be by next year, roughly? 20, 20 trillion. All right, so that's 20 trillion. How many people in the United States? 330 million about, right? So that's spread across that group. Now, with the demographics, um, once upon a time, people had larger families, and the age of people was different. So, as far as the average person. So that's radically changed. So now, where once upon a time, when Social Security, for example, was implemented, the number of people who would be there, who were young people, to pay off the cost of Social Security for those retiring was about one person retiring, 15 people paying into it. And it's now dropped to about two to three people paying into it. And so with that kind of a trend, that means that your debt is going to mount very quickly. And on top of it, does anybody know what the cost of money is right now, the interest rate set by the Fed? It's essentially zero percent, all right? So the cost of money is zero. Now, the cost of money always is something. So the Fed is actually reducing the, the, the price of money by force, it's a form of price controls. If it actually took its finger off the needle, the price would jump up to some level. But as soon as it jumps up, the cost of that, that debt of 20 trillion is gonna absolutely skyrocket because you have to pay interest on the debt every year. So the debt is no trivial question, all right? And so, did you get your number yet? Uh, mine over future is 1 point, almost 1.4 million. Okay, so if you guys scroll to the side, scroll to the right, the you move, like right, you'll see what the equivalent is in all these different things, yeah. Yes, it's calculated over a lifetime. That's right, exactly. Yeah. I'm sorry? It asks for your degree. It, yeah, it asks if you have a high school education, do you have a college degree, et cetera. And so, and that does, that's an important predictor of what kind of income you, what kind of income you will have during the course of your life. It's not a perfect predictor, but it's a strong predictor. What are the other assumptions in the model? I know there's a methodology link down here, but it's also saying National debt of 2067, 608 billion. Like, are there other, are there other things that are driving? All the numbers used are from the CBO number and, and also the White House Office uh, of the Budget. And so we, the numbers we believe are actually way on the conservative side because of politics. And so, uh, but we wanted to make it as dependable as possible based on the conventional view. So even given that conventional view, what would be the outcome? And it's, it's pretty shocking. One thing you can also find out is what would you own if the money was instead privately invested? And it's really shocking. Very and, and conservatively invested. So the, the point here is that this is an easy way to, to see this. And then, as I said, you can then, if you go to the problem page, you see the, there's a tab at the bottom, see it says problems? 
click on that and you'll see the five questions from the videos. And you click on those and then that's when you can get these different uh, shots that I showed you a few minutes ago. These different pages like the one on the left. So uh, if you also go to, on the, on the bottom you'll see also a tab that says, I think it says about us, is that right? About? Or info? Okay, click on that. Okay, so there's a, there's a button on that page that says NSA spine, all right? Okay, and it's an on-off button. So what happens when you turn it off? It keeps on coming back on, so you can't turn it off. So the, the whole app is full of these kinds of jokes and things, but also it's a mix, mixture of jokes with, with serious content. How do you see the adoption of things like the NSA and millennials? Um, because throughout history, we've seen that these uh, libertarian philosophies have not had the impact as socialist philosophy throughout time. So, do you see any difference uh, right now than like traditional history has shown us? Well, it depends on on where you want to start your your assessment. But I think that just looking at the current trends, there is a great disillusionment with people with uh, Washington. Uh, if we look at the views of millennials per se, uh, the millennial group um, in 2008 either voted overwhelmingly for Obama or didn't vote, and the view was that they were too apathetic. But not because they didn't trust the government or whatever, it's just that they believed it wasn't worth their time, the government would take care of them, and so forth. So. Uh, the different survey places I mentioned, like the Pew Research and others, show that most millennials had a very high level of trust in government, and over a number of years it was gradually tapering down until the Obamacare website came online, healthcare.gov. And do you remember what happened when that came online? Since October 2013. Do you remember what happened? It, could, it didn't work. It wouldn't work week after week, month after month. It still doesn't really work. Right? So a lot of these young people, maybe you included, tried to sign up and the supporters of Obamacare believed that this was going to lock them in, make them dependent on Obamacare. They already were pro-big government, essentially. This would lock them in and from a political standpoint, they would then vote Democratic or whoever was in power who was supporting it. But what happened instead was that a lot of these people said, you can't even get a website to work and you want to take care of my tonsils or heart transplant or my mother's arthritis or, or whatever. Forget it. This is ridiculous. And they started asking other questions according to these surveys. One was, come to think of it, how do I pay off my student loan debt? Come to think of it, I can't get a good job. I can't afford health care. I can't even find a good place to live. And by December of that year, that's when the revelations came out about the NSA spying on their cell phones. So those were the five questions. And so that's been tracking pretty consistently. And some people think the recent election, the last November election, changed because of this margin of difference. Now, what happened also was so the Republicans take over the Senate, they increase their, their percentage in the House, and then the people who voted realized they've done nothing. They've done nothing to change anything. If anything, they've simply gone along with more of the same thing. So they became even more upset, right? So there's this growing group of people, and it's not just millennials, but millennials was a big part of it. And it's now, it's now really cutting across society. Now, the, the, the disillusionment in Washington started really with going back with the disillusionment, war weariness about the wars in Iraq, uh, the revelations about torture, about uh, many other you know, civil liberties issues and so on and so forth. And then the economy tanked in 2008. Do you know why that happened, by the way? What caused that downturn? Debt. Hmm? Debt. debt, that's right. What, caused, what was the cause of the debt? Cheap loans. Hmm? Cheap loans, interest, interest loans. The biggest part of it was uh, housing loans which were uh, created by an act called the Community Reinvestment Act. What they did is they, they essentially made it possible for people who didn't have good credit to get loans at subprime rates, which is the prime rates are the best rate anybody can get. So this is below the best rate. And since these people didn't have the means to pay off the loans, 
they couldn't pay them. And so when the uh, debt continued to mount at some point, it simply couldn't be sustainable and it just fell apart. So in any event, the, uh, the bailouts that followed that were what's what created a huge backlash. Uh, that's where the Tea Party came from, that's where a lot of other uh, and people like Rand Paul got elected because of that, many other people. So the general disillusionment is something that's been building. But your question is a very good one further about why is socialism or statism uh, appealing to people, right? And Bob Higgs's book, Crisis and Leviathan, discusses how crises are used to scare people. But there's also a sort of philosophical outlook in society, a cultural outlook, that the, uh, uh, there are no, there's no absolute truths, there's no objective morality, that uh, what is moral is, is situational, and we can't know anything that will be true this year, will be true next year. So economic principles don't exist, it changes over time, moral principles change. And 100 years ago, it would, have been, it would have been considered 99% of the public would have thought the income tax was the height of immorality. Now it's considered to be necessary. In fact, people who criticize it would be viewed as cranks and crackpots and immoral. Uh, the same thing with wars, the same thing with many other things. So there is a certain cultural consensus, and this is what Tocqueville talked about in his book. There was something unusual about American society. Part of it was the Judeo-Christian tradition, and also cynicism about the king or the monarch being an, a human being also, and shouldn't have special powers over others. So I think the good news is that there is a um, disillusionment. A lot of it also is being fed by what you guys are doing, which is using new technologies to build bridges and build products that serve people directly, right? Uh, and I think that is, is also part of what we're involved in with LoveGov. From what I've seen, at least with other things in life, that a frustration with the government or whatever it might be without a valid call to action leads to cynicism, despair, and frustration. Yeah. Where's the valid call to action with all of this, with your app, with anything else? All you've told me to do so far is get frustrated. Yeah, well, frustration uh, is not the goal, but getting people to sort of wake up, so to speak, to realize there is a problem. And don't just be sort of suckered into believing that things are just fine and dandy, because if you don't realize the, the, the nature of the danger, so to speak, you will be harmed. Okay? So the app is designed to shift people so they get information that they can actually articulate and understand things and connect with other people. So. Ideas have consequences, is the bottom line. If people, as Bob Higgs shows in his book, Crisis and Leviathan, what happens in a crisis is that a politician declares an emergency and says, he or she says, I need special powers. I need the constraints on my powers relaxed because I need tax authority. I need to suspend habeas corpus. I need to go to war, I need whatever it might be because without me, you're going to be threatened with this dire problem. So during this time, interest groups flocked to get what they couldn't get before because it wasn't legal. And so in the process of the crisis, where people are afraid, the, ch the culture changes where people believe that you had to have government powers to solve the crisis, legal precedent changes and so forth. And people get used to this sort of involvement of government intervention in their lives. As I said, something that when Tocqueville wrote Democracy in America, people could, could not have even conceived of it. In fact, most people at that time thought George Washington was still President of the United States. In fact, you took the polls in the 19th century, most people didn't know who the President was. Can you imagine that? Well, if you go to a country like Switzerland, who's the President of Switzerland? Does anybody know? They have cantons, but there is a president. But nobody knows because the president doesn't have much power, right? So the point is that ideas have consequences. So before political action, whether it's a state initiative, whether it's a legal case, whether it's a bill in Congress or whatever, or, or in the case of 
the Soviet Union, the collapse of the Berlin Wall and so forth, you have to have a cultural shift. You have to cultural shift where people say, no, we won't accept that. That's not acceptable morally or economically. And we, we are saying that we're going to take a stand that this is the way it should be. We want the law to reflect these values, not we're not going to hand that authority over to you unilaterally. So that's the power of it. Okay, And so politics is downstream of culture. That's the key point. All right? So we're in a 501c3 foundation, a nonprofit. We can't advocate bills and do state initiatives. Tim has had a number that he's done. He had the five state initiative, which didn't get, didn't get approved for the ballot. Before that, he did one on school choice. And those were very, very admirable efforts. They didn't win. But they also educated a certain number of people. So the key is that what we're in the business of doing is to change the culture and to connect with people on issues that they most care about and show them the way out. And to do that in targeted ways with academics and journalists and opinion makers and what have you, and to do that in huge scales like LoveGov. So as of um, about a week ago, we had 1.8 million combined views of LoveGov. There are 80 million millennials, right? 97.4% of the viewers of LoveGov are millennials. We know that because you can target market people and you can track who watches it very specifically. Something we couldn't have done five years ago, or 10 years ago. It would have been inconceivable. So I, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but I think that's the best way to look at it. How do you feel about certain things where it's like private companies like Facebook or Google carrying huge amounts of our own private data that effectively are gathered in ways that we are not declared, like not clearly declared or buried in privacy policies and things like that versus, you know, government systems? Well, it, 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 there's two, two parts of it. One is that if, you know, if, if you are, you know, when you apply for a credit card or any, any sort of information that you're, you're um, turning over to somebody, that's a, that's a contract. You're agreeing to that, and the contract should stipulate what the terms are. Can they share it? I mean, for example, we as an institute have, we're supported by private donations. And so we have a policy of not sharing the names of people who are donors. We think it's, unless they give us the right to do that. So that, that's part of something called the Donors Bill of Rights. So we have that on our website so people can trust that we are going to protect their information. Other firms may not promise that. In the case of Google, I mean of uh, Facebook and others, uh, they're confronted with another problem. And the other problem is that under the Homeland Security Acts, Patriot Act and so forth, they're obligated to share it. Verizon has no choice. That's why in the video series in the fifth episode, when Gov has this male visitor, he's from the cell phone company, all right? And the implication is that it was Verizon or some company like that. So Verizon is, is, is obligated to share the information, and most tech companies are obligated to have back doors in their software programs, like Microsoft and others, so the government can access that information today. Now, there are people who want to create um, ways to have um, uh, crypto locks and so forth, which is something that is being pursued. And it's, I, I imagine it's going to be pretty hard to oversee that or to overrule that globally. But that's part of the, the battle. And, uh, but the, uh, there are people who want to control everything, all the information about everything you do. As Gov said, you know, he can, doesn't even have to open the envelope, essentially. He can get all the emails, and just from certain aspects of the emails, the words that are in the emails, he can put together pretty sophisticated, uh, uh, essentially, background information on the choices you make, who you are, what your voting habits are, uh, what your lifestyle is like, and so on. And uh, uh, people who are interested in socialism, essentially, central planning, they need that information because they believe in the folly that with it they can somehow achieve their ends. Last question. Yeah. How does the independent um, institutes um, generate income or sustain itself? Is it primarily through book sales, private donations? And who are some of your biggest private donors? Well, we, um, as you can tell from this, the video, uh, we started out with no money and it was bootstrapped up. Um, it's a lot easier to create a so-called think tank. I hate that term because it's so pejorative. It's 
the idea that there are people in this tank and they're looking down at everybody and telling them what, what they should know. But anyway, that's what we're called. Um, anyway, the idea is that the, uh, we had to build a, um, a number of sort of customers who were members and supporters. There are people who support us because they care about health care or they care about housing or they care about war and peace or civil liberties or something. There are others who just want to be able to get our new book or get the independent review or get our op-eds that we send them or something. So there are services that we provide and they get a tax deduction for it. Okay? We take no government money, we do no contract work, we're not a consulting firm, we don't, we're not for hire. Um, so the idea is that we do work that is independent, hence the name, and all of the work that we do, all the things that are said in LoveGov as far as the information on the app is backed up by peer-reviewed work. Does anybody not know what peer review means? Don't be afraid if you don't. Peer review is, a, is just the standard in, in scholarship that you invite a group of scholars in that field to critically analyze what you do to check for errors. So we're somewhat unusual in the so-called think tank world that everything we do goes through peer review. All of our books, the journal, all the articles that this is based on and so on. And so we are an organization that's completely private and independent is the idea. And we, the idea is to reinforce its independence so there's no big donors who can threaten us by threatening to pull out and we have to go with what they want because we don't have that. We have a broad diversification of support and uh, we like it that way. All right, thank you. Thank you.